It sort of happened spontaneously. I had a date to play at a venue that turned out to have wonderful acoustics. And the piano was magnificent. I said to myself, wow, this is one time I really ought to get a top recording engineer to come in and do his thing. And I found a person who was absolutely superb engineer. He came in and did a multiple microphone setup on this piano and got some of the most beautiful piano sound I've ever had in, in the 45 years of recording that I've been doing. And I think it was a special night. The combination of the acoustics of the room, a wonderful instrument, and an audience that really was willing to reach out and meet the music halfway. It brought out the best in me, and I'm very, very excited about that night and very happy to have it available on CD. <laughs> There's probably going to be a wider dynamic range over the course of the evening in a solo piano concert than may occur with a trio, although not necessarily because even when I'm playing with a trio there's often unaccompanied solo piano sections that might get as quiet as a whisper. I have to completely supply all the music and I tend to think orchestrally, so when I'm doing a solo piano concert, I'm trying in a way to be an orchestra of a kind. At times playing very sparely, very, very few notes, at other times wanting to sound like a 120-piece symphony. And so it, it pulls for everything one has ever learned about music if you're doing solo piano work. It requires, I think, a broader palette of colors to be able to paint with than when, say, playing with a trio. The trio requires different sorts of things. It has its own wonderful challenge of the interaction uh, between and among three people to try to make a music that feels organic, that comes out of three sources. And I love that. I would hate to ever stop doing that. But I think there is something very special and very intimate and perhaps ultimately the most personal kind of musical statement when you're just sitting at the piano all by oneself. Precipice is the title tune of the CD, and I felt it was appropriate because Precipice to me does connote being on the edge, looking down over an abyss, that it's dangerous, that it's exciting, that it has a vantage point, and I think it's very much true of the flavor of this piece, which goes through a lot of different feelings and sections and it's a very high energy piece overall. But I thought it was an appropriate title for the album because I think I was stretching on this album in each piece to try to find new music in myself, to try to, to make something new and, and really organic. Well, you know, it, it's, it's such an impossibly absurd title. I love to announce it when I'm playing uh, in a concert because it always gets a laugh. Because the love theme from Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Come on, what, what is that going to be? But it really was a very central part of the film. Uh, Philip Kaufman, the director, impressed on me early on that the two major protagonists, in this case, Brooke Adams and Donald Sutherland, who fell in love in the context of this incredible crisis of humanity, represented really the last two human beings on Earth. So that this song needed to evoke not only the love, but the haunting sorrow that this was the quiet death knell of the human race. So he had pretty strong convictions about how this piece should function for the movie and I was I was very happy that he was so happy with this piece the way it turned out
Typically at a solo piano concert, I like to start with a free improvisation. It's a way for me to sort of feel my way into the evening, get a sense of the audience, the room, how it's going to feel that night with people in it, and to really make friends with the instrument. So a free improvisation really allows me most latitude for that. And then I like to segue into a statement of the first actual piece of the evening. In this case, it was What is this thing called love? That's a standard I've played for years and years. I've recorded it several times in the past, and it's a great vehicle for me. And I usually like to work my way into John Coltrane's uh, arrangement and uh, evocation of that tune, which he called Fifth House. So this piece then works its way from free improvisation into a statement of what is this thing called love, at least harmonically, then John Coltrane's treatment of it, and then finally ends up at the very end with an actual statement of the theme of what is this thing called love. I'm always hoping that, that I will stretch in any musical context, and not artificially, because then if I'm manipulating the music, it doesn't feel authentic to me. I see as my challenge, really, is to get out of the way of the music, to allow myself, if possible, to enter a kind of altered state of consciousness where I'm experiencing the music as happening rather than I'm producing the music. When that experience is at its greatest depth, I really feel like I'm a conduit for the music. And that, in a sense, if I'm with players on the bandstand, we're all in the audience listening to the music together, and that it's coming from somewhere. But uh, if I'm playing with a trio in, in that setting, I don't even have that much of a sense of who is playing what. It's just music is happening. If I'm playing as a soloist, it'll be as though I'm just listening to some music that's emerging from a piano and just trying to be open and interested in what it is and how it's emerging from moment to moment and trying to, again, stay out of the way. It's a kind of merger experience where you lose the boundaries of yourself and become just pure intention, just pure music.